Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the home of New Zealand's only specialist UX research practice and world-class UX lab, enabling brave teams across the globe to de-risk product design and equally brave leaders to shape and scale design culture. You can find out a little bit more about that at thespaceinbetween.co.nz. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to keep on top of the latest thinking and important issues affecting the fields of UX research, product management, and design. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of a diverse range of world-class leaders in those fields. My guest today is Andy Budd. Andy is an independent executive product and design leadership coach and a venture partner at Seedcamp, Europe's most successful seed fund, investing in over 450 companies who have gone on to raise over $7 billion. At Seedcamp, Andy helps to assess the potential of startup companies, and once a company joins the portfolio, he provides the founders with advice on how to grow and scale. Before joining Seedcamp, Andy was the founder, managing director and then CEO of Clearleft, arguably the United Kingdom's first user experience consultancy. During his 17 years there, Andy relentlessly promoted the value of design and helped clients such as Channel 4, Virgin Holidays and Penguin Books to realise their digital potential. Andy would also found two product businesses of which some of you might be familiar, FontDeck and Silverback, the latter a popular usability testing app for Mac. In 2008, in the midst of the GFC, Andy founded UX London, Britain's first major user experience conference. It would become the longest running UX conference in all of Europe, and it was an event that he lovingly curated until 2021. Andy was also the founder and curator of Deconstruct, the first digital design conference in the UK, and of Leading Design, an annual event and 2,000 plus strong community that brings together some of the world's best design leaders. First rising to prominence in design circles in 2006, after authoring the best-selling book, CSS Mastery, Advanced Web Standard Solutions, which seems fitting, at least for this sentence, as Andy became a founding member of the Adobe Design Circle in 2019. And now he's here with me for this conversation on Brave UX. Andy, hello and a very warm, sunny New Zealand summer welcome to you. Oh, hey there. I have to admit, it was kind of, it was tough kind of not, you know, listening to all of that stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff in there. So I, I applaud you through getting through it all. But um, yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It's really nice to uh, be here. It's very nice to have you here too, Andy. And I have to say, traveling around the internet, looking at some of the weird and wonderful things you've done was a a great pleasure. I discovered that you're a fellow diver, although you're on another, you're in another echelon to (laughs) to me. You're a qualified paddy dive instructor. And you've also dived in some pretty interesting locations. Uh, One of them is one of the world's most extensive cave systems. And for anyone that knows anything about diving, diving in caves is a possibly one of the most dangerous situations that you can put yourself in. And you've also once dived on an abandoned or sunk World War II shipwreck that was still packed full of live ammunition. And I couldn't help but think, think about this. What on earth possessed you to want to do something as dangerous as that? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, yeah, I've, I, I, I kind of really enjoy scuba diving. I love the kind of sense of adventure and discovery. And I think, I guess I'm intrigued by being able to go to places that um, other people haven't seen. So I think sort of, you know, when I first started diving in caverns in, in Mexico, in, in around the Tulum area, when you just cavern dive, you're not allowed to go into the caves. And so you see these big signs with a skull and crossbone saying, do not enter. <laughs> and a lot of people very sensibly would go, well, that just seems like a stupid idea. I don't want to go in there. But for me, it was like, oh, I wonder what's in there. And I wonder what I need to do and learn in order to be able to to go and explore some more. And I think the same is true of like diving in shipwrecks. I'm, I'm not a big, big wreck diver. I'm much more into cave diving, but there's something really interesting about going into somewhere that's not meant to be there, going into a shipwreck that's like 40 meters underwater, that's got a whole story in history and you're, you're swimming through these holds and there's trains and there's motorbikes and there's cars and tanks and loads of kind of like guns lined up and shells and all these kind of things. And it's just... It's fascinating. There's a whole kind of 
pivoting slightly, but there's a whole kind of group of people that call themselves UXers, urban explorers. Uh, it's a, a very French thing. And they go and they explore disused warehouses and factories and kind of nuclear power plants. And I guess it's a similar thing. It's the ability to go somewhere where people haven't been before and wanting to explore and poke around. And so, yeah, that's kind of what I get, I guess, from from the, the cave diving and the wreck diving. So when you were entering that sunken World War II ship, I believe it was a German a German shipwreck. Um, it would have been no, it would have been a it would have been a English wreck that was um, taking munitions and arms and and stuff to resupply during the Second World War. I imagine that people may have died as a result of that shipwreck. What was the sense that you had, if you cast your mind back to when you first entered it, what was the sense that you had of the feeling or the thoughts that came to mind when you were doing that? I mean, there are there are definitely a lot of wrecks that are kind of scheduled monuments that you really aren't meant to go to because they're war graves. So these are all the places that I kind of dive. I don't do I don't dive anywhere that is um, illegal or immoral or, or kind of not something you're not allowed to go to. So these these wrecks are places that you can go to. But I do think that I see a lot of people who dive who don't necessarily respect the space because these are sort of graves. And like you say, people have died on them. And so it is interesting. It is eerie to to go into a place and being able to imagine that 50, 60 years ago, there were people walking around and, and, and playing cards. And, you, you know, you notice, you know, a knocked over cup and a, and a kind of, you know, a, a disused kind of, you know, set of plates or whatever. And you can tell that like these people's lives were sort of, uh, momentarily stopped and and you know you've got this sort of sense of eerie emptiness about it and so it's kind of it, it's a fascinating um experience to kind of be in that that space and like i say it's similar to I, I know people that have been to kind of like disused kind of like nuclear power plants and, and places like that and it's that sense of people used to live here and were here but but aren't anymore that is 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 interesting i guess Perhaps as a bit of an aside, uh, I've only travelled to the United Kingdom once and it was maybe six or seven years ago. And New Zealand being a relatively new nation, albeit the Māori people have been here for over 800 years, there isn't the same sense of the built environment and the age of the built environment. And I got a sense when I was visiting my uncle in Farnham, looking at the cobbles on the streets and just realising that there were hundreds, maybe a thousand years worth of footfall on those cobbles that had worn them down in certain places. And it does give you a, a greater sense or an appreciation of lives that have previously been lived. And it is quite airy when it's in their absence as well. I mean, I think it's the same. Yeah. Like, you know, I came, I, I had a kind of a trip up to Scotland um, over the sort of the autumn and you go to all these kind of old castles that, you know, hundreds of years of history and different clans and battles. And so, yeah, it's kind of interesting kind of being able to kind of feel like you're, you're, you're living and, and getting a sense of what it must have been like. 50, 60 years ago for a, a, a soldier or a merchant Navy person in the Second World War or five, 600 years ago as a Highlander having to deal with, you know, British or English incursion. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it, it's, it is interesting. Mm. Well, we've been talking about sort of the absence of, of life in those spaces. And I want to talk about a space where there was a ton of life. And that is, I also found out that you had a, a go at being what you described as a shark wrangler something that you've retired from uh, how does one wrangle sharks <laughs> well i mean to be honest that was a little bit of a jokey name there was a a terrible movie called uh, deep blue sea from like the i think the early 2010s maybe and one of the characters in there was kind of described as a shark wrangler so i just kind of like mentioned it jokingly but what i did do is i worked on liverboard boats going out of the barrier reef and we used to do shark feeds and what would happen is you would you would drive out with a tender, you'd put a whole bunch of fish heads on a on a um, wire, you'd drop a weighted wire down, and it would attract the sharks. And I best my job was effectively we'd have all of the kind of the the guests who would be sort of floating or sat on a rock outcrop, a bommy, and basically our job was to kind of position ourselves between the the sharks and the customers. And if the sharks got a little bit interested, you'd just be a kind of a human shield or you might give one a little gentle kind of, you know, kind of not bump, but you kind of you'd make your 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 presence felt just so there was a little bit of a kind of a, a yeah, I could say like a barrier between the, 
the sharks and the customers. So yeah, I kind of, I guess I was a, a shark food bouncer or, or some other way of kind of describing that, but yeah. A first line of defense. Andy, have you always been comfortable facing your fears like this? Um, I don't think I face my fears particularly. I like doing pursuits. So there are, there are a bunch of people out there who are adrenaline junkies. And to be honest, like that's not me. I think they're kind of idiots. You know, you put your life at risk or whatever. I like doing things where there is a, a level of skill and control. And if you do what you do well, the risk is very minimal. So I don't want to do stuff that's risky. I want to do stuff that is very low risk. And it's the act of, you know, training as a cave diver, you know, being aware of animal behavior and, and, and when sharks are starting to feel a little bit aggressive or a little bit kind of stressed. Um, I recently learned to fly and I'm, I'm a, a pilot. So I'm a, I'm a trained pilot now. And the joy of being able to kind of do a risky thing, I guess, like taking off a landing. But if you do it well, the risk is is minimal. But what you get is you get access to seeing amazing things, having great adventures. So, yeah, r- risk is not something I'm particularly interested in chasing. It's something I'm interested in minimizing through talent, skill, p- training practice. And it also lends itself to... Interesting questions at the beginning of design focused podcast interviews. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this is the one you've, I, I, the, you know, I think this is the only interview I've had where you've lent, someone's lent in so heavily to, to those areas. Usually it's a, a little kind of touch on that and then diving straight into kind of the topic. But I've really enjoyed chatting about some of this stuff. So, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You, you mentioned risks and how you, it sounds like you feel like you're more of a calculated risk taker and you mitigate that risk by putting in the appropriate training. And one of the risks that from the outside looking in that I could see that you've taken recently is stepping down from the day-to-day leadership of Clearleft, the agency that you founded way back when. And you went on to join Seacamp, as I mentioned in your introduction, which is, at least from my way of looking at, quite a remarkable departure from the professional life that you were living for many years into something which is an entirely new, although albeit tangential area of design and business uh, that you had been exposed to previously. So what was it that predicated this shift or that made you feel comfortable assuming this risk of this new role and spending your time, you know, instead of leading an agency sifting through pitch decks and working with founders to help grow and scale their companies? It's a really good question. And there's probably a whole range of different ways I could answer that. I think it first helps for me to maybe describe a little bit about kind of my own kind of sort of personal mission. I don't kind of mean that in kind of like a a fuzzy, airy, fairy way. Not everyone has to have a mission, all that kind of stuff. But I think the thing that I've noticed that has driven me throughout my career is a real belief in the value of design, a real belief that how design can transform people's lives, individuals' lives, users' lives, and also through the process of doing that can transform business outcomes. And so, you know, when I started noodling around on the web, I discovered CSS and HTML and web standards and really felt that this was a benefit to the world. You know, the old way of doing things was very inaccessible information locked up in in proprietary flash files, information locked into kind of like hard to read kind of, you know, table-based layouts. And so I thought, you know, design had the ability to open up this information and open up the web. So one of the reasons I got into into the web and particularly design, because I thought it could make that experience better. One of the reasons I started blogging was because I felt a desire to take any information that I'd learned and share it around um, freely because I had benefited from other people's free sharing information and I wanted to do the same. And this was all in the service of trying to make design better. Discovering, you know, and, and kind of like leading in this kind of UX field. Like when I started UX, there was really only one agency, other other agency in the world called um, Adaptive Path that kind of acclaimed that term. And I really believe that this was a great way to bring quality and value to people's lives. And so, you know, I helped kind of drive that forward. It's why I speak at conferences, is why I wrote books. And so starting Clearleft was a natural progression to that because sure, I could help a bunch of designers and engineers do a better job, but also I felt that I needed to kind of help end customers. And so going into an agency setting and, you know, every, you know, two months, like helping a new company, helping them solve a bunch of meaningful problems, helping them get value in the hands of their customers that they could really use. 
was a big driver. If you kind of think about where the industry was in the kind of like the early 20 to mid 20, uh, 20 hundreds, two, 2000s, anyway, whatever, whatever the term is, the teens, the people who were making a difference, the people who were having an impact on the industry were people like Adaptive Path, people like Happy Cobb, people like Cuban Council, people like Clear Left, you know, the people who were speaking at conferences, the people who other people looked up to and wanted to be like were those companies, partly because they were forging a path, partly because a lot of the big tech companies were not big at that stage, they were quite small. And so I think the pioneers in that early, those early days were the freelancers and then the agencies. But if you jump forward to kind of 2015 and you ask a designer where you want to go and work now, they were no longer saying, I wanted to work at Adaptive Path and Clear Left. They were saying, I wanted to work at Facebook. I wanted to work at Google. As somebody who has always liked working in small independent companies, I didn't necessarily want to go and work in a big tech company. I think if you've founded a business, it's really difficult to step out of that and then go and work in a very, very large hierarchy, particularly if you're someone like me that kind of believes in kind of small independent uh, kind of organizations. But I still had this desire to kind of have an impact. And I, I realized the influence of agencies was diminishing. And if I wanted to carry on trying to raise the profile of design, I needed to find another outlet. The two outlets that I, I've followed, one is um, I coach. So I coach heads, directors and VPs of product and design. And what I'm doing there is I'm helping those individuals improve their impact and improve the impact of product and design in their organizations. And so a couple of days a week, I spend my time focusing on that. And I feel that I can have a huge impact by working closely and directly with people who work in those big companies in order to, rather than just help one company, help 10, 20, 30, 40. So my, my impact is multiplied. But a lot of those design and product leaders are facing the same problem. And that problem is they are in an organization that culturally doesn't value design. And they are struggling to sell design and to unlock the power, often to an organization that has become incredibly successful without really needing to think about design. They, they lent into technology, they lent into marketing, they lent into sales. And so it's really, really tough if the culture of the company at its core doesn't value design to transform it. And I'm trying to do that with these people. I'm trying to help them transform the companies. But the other part of me is thinking, well, what if rather than having to transform companies, we can bake that value in from the start. And what's the best way to bake value in at the start? Well, you're there at the start. And if you can be, I could have just gone and started an early stage company or been working for one. But what if I was actually working in an institution that supports lots of these companies? And so going and joining a venture fund allows me to work with a couple of dozen founders who maybe don't have a full appreciation of design. You know, often founders just think it's the, the pixels and they're making it look pretty. But design is also around understanding user needs. It's about solving problems. Um, I think designers have a huge amount to offer when it comes to that zero to one phase of kind of figuring out what the product needs to do. They have a great amount to offer around kind of growing and scaling, product-led growth and, and, and all that kind of good stuff. And so... At Seacamp, my personal mission is to try and show through my knowledge and my experience to all these founders how valuable design can be. So they hire their first designer, they hire their second designer, they hire their third designer. They see their performance improve by having a designful mind so that when it is time to hire that first design leader, that first head of design, that first VP of design, they are already bought in to the value design can bring so that the people that they hire have an easier time. They're not running uphill. They're not trying to create a new culture. They're already surfing on that existing culture. And so I guess I'm trying to close the, the circle by attacking the problem from both sides. Now, you've spoken about your time working with founders, and I don't know specifically what I'm about to quote now relates to your time while at Sea Camp or your time that preceded that or perhaps both of those times but you've said and I'll quote you now you'd think this truth would be self-evident by now how companies like Apple Airbnb and Deliveroo have dominated markets through superior convenience experience and design yet it's amazing how many startups are still optimized around an old model of doing things of being a technology business first and only considering the customer experience at a later date so there it sounded to me like founders are making a trade-off between 
the business focus or the technology and design almost as if they can't they feel like they can't afford to do both at the same time so to find product market fit while having a great user experience is that how you've seen them look at this challenge of working with design to some extent yes but i actually i'd kind of turn it around i don't think as an industry we have done a particularly good job of explaining the value that we can bring to companies. We just expect that founders will understand all the things that we know. And we know these things because we've read dozens of books. We've seen Jared Spall talk at conferences. We've done all this stuff. So we have a really, really burning belief in the value of design. We just expect that everybody else out in the marketplace should just get it and are surprised when they don't. And so I think it's on us. I don't think it's on on the the founders to somehow intrinsically, magically know this value. I think it's on us to communicate it. And I think we've done a terrible job of communicating it. When I look at the different disciplines that founders gravitate to, those disciplines have done a much better job of adding their value. You know, they hire a marketer because it's clear the value marketers bring. They hire a a product manager because it's clear that the the product managers are kind of shaping the the shape of the product and trying to find product market fit and figure out what's the most kind of feature that's going to drive that growth. They hire uh, customer experience people and and, and kind of um, customer success people and sales people. And all of these people are contributing to the, the value creation that happens in a startup. The design is often kind of like the icing on the cake. It's like, well, now we know what we're going to build and now we know how it works. We kind of need to get someone in to make it look pretty. And a design is like, oh, but we're more than pretty. But we haven't communicated that in a way that's landed. And so I think that's the, the real problem. I don't think it's the founder's fault. I think we've done a really terrible job of, com- of communicating the value of design. And I think a lot of it is because of all the kind of infighting. Oh, I'm a UX designer. Oh, I'm an interaction designer. Oh, I'm a product designer. Oh, design doesn't exist. Oh, we're all designers. Well, that's not a very credible way of communicating your value. I'm not seeing product managers have those conversations. I'm not seeing marketing managers having those conversations. Marketing managers are saying, and product managers are saying, we should be consulted here. We should own this space. Whereas you have a whole bunch of kind of circular internal conversations that don't help anybody. You have designers go, oh, well, you know, like NPS, net promoter score is a rubbish made up term and we're not going to engage with it. Well, that's great. You're not engaging with it. And so when somebody says we need to increase the sentiment of our our product and UX is going, we're not having nothing to do with that. Then they go to marketing and they go to product managers who are willing to engage. You know, every time we get thrown a, a, a ball to hit, you know, we, we don't try and knock it out of the park. We just kind of, you know, like go into some kind of, you know, kind of self, you know, narcissistic kind of, you know, internal squabble. And while we're kind of like squabbling in the corner, somebody else kind of, you know, goes in and, and kind of knocks the ball out of the park. And so I kind of think we've had lots of opportunities and we've squandered many of them. And so if it, if we're squandering these opportunities, why Do we not look a little bit more internally rather than just constantly blaming, you know, the executives or the founders for not getting it? Like if they're not getting design, why aren't they getting it? It's because we haven't explained it properly. Well, let's dig into that a little deeper because you've touched on this before. You gave a really great talk last year from Business to Buttons called, I think it was called Design's Midlife Crisis. And in that talk, you talked about the challenge of communicating the value of design, particularly to executives. So it sounds like you're aware that designers are trying to do this, but perhaps the methods or the ways in which we've been approaching this haven't been that effective. And you said, and I'll quote you again now, you said the majority of execs don't want to have some designer educating them about the benefits of design. In fact, it can come across as quite patronizing and antagonizing more often than anything else, more often than not at backfires. So if taking a McKinsey's The Business of Value of Design report to an executive and giving them a reading isn't the thing that's going to help them to understand what it is that we do and the value we can bring, what approach or approaches have you seen that are successful, that have worked, that people do understand and do connect with and can actually help to shift the perception of design as a cost center into one that contributes to profit and helps the business to get ahead? I mean, I think you've sort of answered your own question there. It's to reposition it from a a cost centre to a profit centre by demonstrating the value that it does bring and can bring rather than telling people about it. If 
all you do is go, oh, you need to give us more money and you need to give us more resources. And if only you just believe in us and do this, that and the other, we would show you that design is valuable. And that's great. But if marketing over here can point to a bunch of figures and say, we spent this much money on marketing and it had this kind of increase and you can do the same with sales, you can do the the same with your product lift growth team. And then you've got a bunch of designers whining and going, oh, but, you know, billion dollar button, oh, you know, 52 shades of blue or whatever, you know, kind of it doesn't come across as credible. What tends to happen is. And I I often try to find myself kind of like trying to walk some of my coaching clients back off the edge because they're like, okay, like I've not spoken to anyone in the business this year, like, but I've got, I've been given 20 minutes at the, at the, at the big kind of like executives meeting. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to show, I'm going to give them like the best deck ever. And they're going to listen to this deck and the scales are going to come off their eyes and they're going to be realizing, oh, stupid us, like the value of design, we you know, we should have seen it before. And, and we're going to like applaud the person and we're going to lift you up on our shoulders and we're going to carry out of the room screaming. And that's all I need to do, like the 20 minute presentation. And so they work on it and they work on it for weeks and they want to get it perfect. And they give it and no one cares because it's a theoretical argument. What you need to do is you need to show, you need to say, hey, look, you know, this quarter, this month, this year, whatever, you gave the team this much and we delivered X. You know, for every dollar you gave the team, we turned it into five. Imagine what could happen if you gave us $5. Imagine what would happen if you gave us $20. And the way executives work is they, they you know, most executives work in a series of bets. I says, okay, well, that's a good point. If we gave you a dollar, you turned it into five. Here, have $10 and let's see what you can do with it. And if you turn that into five, then it's like, well, that hasn't worked. You're, you're, you're a cost center because all you do is, you, you know, you, you can only have, you know, whatever we put in, you still have the same output. But if you turn it into 20 or 50 or $100, then they're going to give you more and they're going to keep giving you more until you stop making them more money. So I, I think a lot of it is around, the other thing I talk about is kind of this idea that I think a lot of designers think that what they're game, playing is a game of chess. And with a game of chess, there are specific rules and the best chess player always wins. The reality of most businesses is they're not playing a game of chess, they're playing a game of poker. They're playing lots of rounds of poker, lots of hands of poker. And most of them will, will, will not work, but occasionally they'll, they'll get a good hand and that hand will win. And so what I tend to find is a lot of, a lot of designers trying to optimize each hand and going, oh, well, we just, you know, if we just went out and we did six months worth of research, we could really, really win this hand. And The way that you win poker isn't by doing that. It isn't by slowing everything down. It's by spinning things up, getting that sense of like, we released this thing. It didn't work. We released this thing. Oh, it worked a bit better. We released this thing. Oh, this is good. I'm now getting understanding of who the other players are. I'm now getting understanding of the market. Okay, I think this hand is a winner. I'm going to go all in. So I think we're playing the wrong game. I think we need to realize that even though we want it to be chess, we are playing poker. And we need to realize that it's a series of small bets You can't win every one. So it doesn't need to be perfect. It's about volume. It's about velocity. And it's about doubling down when things are working. And if we can demonstrate that, then I think we're onto a winner. Yeah. Yeah. So we're playing the wrong game. We're trying to uh, apply a set of rules to business that no one else is playing by. And therefore, we're getting a pretty poor result. Yep. And to be honest, like, you know, I, I kind of like have a little bit of a joke, you know, like how many designers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Well, first, we need to do a six month research project on the role of light in society. Now, that's an annoying joke because it's so true, because every time I, I, I talk to an engineer or I talk to a product manager or I talk to a, an executive and they go and talk to the design team and say, hey, look, we just, you know, it's really difficult to work here because we can't see any light. Can you just screw in a light bulb? They throw their toys out of the pram. It's like, you don't know me. I'm an artist. We can't work under these conditions. You can't possibly tell me to screw in a light bulb. I have to understand the problem. I have to go out and I have to speak to a whole bunch of people because maybe it's not a light bulb we need. Maybe it's a candle. Maybe it's a bonfire. Like, just, just let me do my art and I'll go out and I'll do all this discovery work and I'll tell you in six months time whether it's a light bulb or not. And then so, you know, you let them go that and in six months time, like, yeah, it's a light bulb. And the rest of the organization are hitting their head on their hands going, we told you this six months ago. Why have you taken us all along this sort of merry path? And so like, that's not to say you shouldn't do research. Research is really important, but sometimes you just have to go, I've been asked to do a thing. Let's do it. And let's do it to the best of our possible ability. 
and let's see how it works because it's a hand of poker rather than a game of chess like if if you only have one chance to win then then you go and do the six month you know research project if you've got multiple chances to win by the time you've kind of you've done the six months you might have missed you know opportunity cost you might have missed 20 winning hands and so we just kind of need to understand the balance so we need to be a little bit less dogmatic we need to be a little bit less following the gut double diamond to precision and getting really upset if we're not allowed to do what we were taught in business school or what we have seen people advocate on stage we seem to be more pragmatic basically you've put this down to previously that it's our inability to really grasp the concept of opportunity cost and that the business needs to make money or do the thing whatever the thing is that they need to do as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And there's definitely a pervasive business culture globally, at least in New Zealand that I've experienced and through my interactions with companies in the United States that favours speed over thought, perhaps. I mean, that's maybe a, a tension there that I'm purposely placing. But being a business owner myself, I understand that. I understand the need for speed, the need to make money in order to perpetuate what it is that the mission of the organization is there to achieve. But I also understand that an, an unbridled pursuit of profit at speed can lead and has led to some pretty poor decisions in some large companies. And also it's led to the end of many, many other companies that have actually misread their market and made significant mistakes by making bets that weren't well considered. So I was curious about your perspective here as to whether or not there is a role for design to be somewhat of a counterweight to the dominant culture that does favour just, you know, getting the light bulb and screwing it on. And actually, if there was any benefit that you see in a commercial context from design intentionally slowing things down to encourage a more considered approach to decision making. I mean, I think I think that's a really, really difficult question to ask, because I think the the behavior of organizations changes depending on the size and, and the state of the, the market. And a lot of it, I think, depends on the amount of potential harm and blowback if you have no customers or five customers or 10 customers the amount of harm you can do by moving quickly i think is is limited by the small size of your market if you are building a social networking platform that could fundamentally undermine the fabric of democracy the risks are much higher and so i think you know again going back to some of the things we were saying earlier like if you were the Wright brothers and you were so worried about crashing the plane that you had to make sure that there were airbags and parachutes and seat belts and, you know, a metal frame that would be, you know, you would never have got the plane off the ground. But at the same time, if you're expecting passengers to go in it, if you're expecting paying passengers to go in it, there's a constant demand to iterate and improve. And we, you know, if you look at kind of the aviation industry, the aviation industry, I studied aviation history, like, you know, the balsa wood kind of death traps of like 150 years ago versus how risk free, um, so risk averse kind of the current aviation industry is. And so I don't think you can look at it as a homogenous thing. I think you need to understand that in the early stages, you need to be fast. You need to prove that the thing works. You get a bit of um, leeway. You have early adopters who are willing to take a little bit more risk in terms of um, what they're getting themselves into. But as soon as you start realizing you've got a market, then there is a, a need to start taking these things seriously. So I'm not saying you don't have to have any the qualms, you know, I think, I do think that designers are often the moral center, the moral heart. I think, you know, it's not a surprise that designers came up with the term dark patterns. It's not a surprise that there's been a lot of pushback against kind of aggressive marketing tactics and the growth hacker mentality, which I think is, as as thankfully waned. You know, you see a lot of kind of unethical practices that organizations have taken, often not realizing they're unethical because they're chasing a target and they're and they're motivated to do whatever they can um, to deliver that target. I do think that designers provide a, a really, really important conscience and break. But at the same time, it's difficult if you're constantly riding the break. You kind of need to earn your position in the organization so that when when you say no, people listen. If the answer to everything is no, then people are going to ignore you. 
if the answer is like, I'll help you here, let's do this, do this. Oh, but we can't do this because of GDPR. We can't do this because of X, Y, Z. Like suddenly, if you're someone that's delivering value and delivering outcomes and are able to demonstrate to the business that they can grow it in a way that balances their drive for commerciality with a caring approach to user needs, then you're onto a winner. So I'm definitely not saying, and don't sort of, I don't want you, you or your audience to misconstrue construe that. I'm saying like, hey, you just you just build, and it doesn't matter. Like I would hate to live in a world, you know, and, and you know, I'm kind of slightly concerned around kind of like Twitter of stripping out all of the checks and balances in order to kind of drive faster faster growth. So I think you need to have a, a an understanding of both. But in order to do that, in order to have the permission and power, design needs to have a much more influential role like let's remember like you know the the challenge i think in a lot of organizations is the hierarchy design reports into product that might report into technology that reports into the ceo we don't necessarily have the the raw power in order to kind of like stop things and so we need to use the soft power we need to use our our political abilities we need to use our ability to network we use our ability to show that some of these practices that people are trying to do might make short-term gains but sacrifice sort of longer term um, gains but we need to be able to show this rather than just like oh i believe this to be true it's like no we need to demonstrate a better way and i think this is one of the great things that designers have you know a lot of the time a product manager will say here's the product we need to do x because they are in belief that this is the only way to do it and I think designers can come back and say, well, this is a great way, but also how about Y and Z? And if we do Y and Z, we might actually get a better outcome and we might avoid these potential harmful, risky scenarios. The other thing I'd say, which again, I think is just a real tricky thing, is I do think that our, I don't think it's necessarily about the kind of, I think it's really easy to kind of blame capitalism and, you know, but I think a lot of development processes, you know, are also the cause. You know, if you are, breaking big problems down into tiny little bite-sized features and the whole focus is just push this next thing out push this next thing out you're not necessarily seeing how everything connects and how bad actors can take control and and and, and do bad things and so i do think the the delivery process of agile doesn't necessarily make it easy for us to have a more moral center when it comes to um making product decisions is it more of a framing of rather than being as fast as possible and more of being as fast as is sensible, where I know the nuance there is on defining what is sensible, but from the perspective of designers needing to think more critically about what's sensible given the goals of the organisation and the needs of the user, and for the for the business to consider or to be more mindful of what, sacri- what they might sacrifice if they p- pursue speed as the primary objective I think so. I mean, again, I think it, I think it sort of comes back a little bit to, again, interestingly, the conversations we had earlier. I think there's a perception that things like diving and flying are risky. And they are only risky if you don't know how to do them properly and you, you are slapdash and you are irresponsible. If you are responsible and do them well, the risks are relatively minimal. But if you want to minimise the risks entirely, you sit in your front room and you play you know, Microsoft Flight Simulator. You, you know, you watch a Jacques Cousteau movie. Like you don't go out into the world because it's scary because things could go wrong. So what you need to do is you need to find the balance. The way I describe it best is, is going around a corner fast. Like you could go around a corner really, really slowly, but, and it's relatively risk-free, but you, you're not getting around the corner as fast as you need to be. You can go put your foot down and not care And there's a really good chance you'll spin off and you'll hurt yourself and you'll hurt somebody. There is this beautiful point when you're going around the corner where the traction is the maximum. You go a little bit too fast and you spin out. But when you kind of feel that sense of of the the, the tires are gripping the road, you are in full control. That is the point I think most organizations kind of need to be in because it's the highest performing but still safe solution. And so, yeah, I think a lot of people... A lot of people have such binary thinking. It's like, oh, you either have to go fast or you have to go slow. Either you have to make money or you don't make money. And I think this is wrong. I think there's a, there's a, there's a balance there. And it's about finding the right pace 
that is right for your time, right for your company, right for your needs, but is optimizing a whole bunch of different things. You know, so yeah, so I, I think that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that kind of perfect curve, that perfect kind of cornering where you're 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 in control, you, you know, and, and you know what you're doing. And so yeah, that's what I think we need to look after. And so the designers I I gel the best with. You know, there's this kind of whole idea of like it takes 20% of your time to get 80% of the way. And then the other 80% of the time to get the last 20%. If you are working in an environment where you've got billions of customers relying, relying on you, yeah, and you've got a ton of resources, spend the time getting that last 20% right. But if you are early and you only have one shot, if you, if you spend all your money, that's not, a, that's not a good sensible thing. Like if you get to that 80%, you can do it really quickly. You can do it four more times. And so I love designers who know when they're starting to get diminishing returns and go, this is good enough. This is not perfect, but it's good enough. And I'm moving to the next thing and that's good enough. I'm moving to the next thing and that's good enough. And that doesn't mean that you're you're not thinking about users or you're not thinking about ethics. It's just, you know, when the extra tinkering isn't really adding value and you could be doing something next that is a much bigger value add because you're creating new stuff rather than, you know, moving the debt chairs around. Mm. And you very briefly earlier on touched on designers seeing themselves as somewhat the ethical heart of the organisation. And this has been a theme that has been a recurrent uh, part of Brave UX and it has come up many times that this is def- this is definitely a thing. We definitely feel that we are. And this conversation around speed, the conversation around designers understanding opportunity costs and being able to better interact with the business is also a central theme. And you've raised that designers default more often than not, and I know we're generalising here, to know and that that gets you shut down and not invited to participate in conversations where you can have more influence. I'm curious about the this tension within design around the ethical ownership of decisions and your perspective on if designers were to say yes more or flip to the other side, and I know that there's, there's many shades of grey here and that sometimes dealing in absolutes is not helpful, but say that we were the other way around and we, we somewhat abandoned that responsibility we feel to our users and we just went and implemented whatever the business wanted to do whenever it wanted to do it, however it wanted to do it. Who do you think within the organisation who would step back and think about and challenge some of the ethics behind the decisions made in product that might negatively affect users? Mm. I mean, I think that's, uh, to be fair, that's an incredibly leading question. And it's uh, <laughs> it's a sort of a, a hypothesis that I'm not advocating for. So you're sort of, you, you're sort of very, very cleverly positioning me to advocate for something that I don't necessarily agree with. My, my position is, Again, it's it's not black or white. It's not binary. I don't think designers should be doing things that are unethical. I don't think that just because you are trying to deliver value and you're trying to deliver value quickly, that automatically equates to being unethical. I think you need to find a balance. And I do think that designers are people, you know, we're user centered. We want to understand what's going on in our customers' lives. We want to make sure that the products we, we build are, are safe and responsible and I think you can do both. So I kind of sort of are dismissing the premise in order to gain status in the organization, we need to stop caring. What I think we need to do is we need to build our value so that we get listened to more. You know, if we are people that are delivering business outcomes and we're delivering business outcomes on a regular basis, to the point that the, the company's like, wow, the, you know, this design team is, is, is amazing. When we then say, actually, this thing you're deciding to do here, we don't think it's ethically sound and here are the reasons why, you will be heard. If you are not delivering value and you have no voice in the organisation and there's no reason not to ignore you because you, you know, you're not really adding a huge amount of value, then you'll get overwritten and, and, and you'll get ignored. And so that's my point. My point is... If we really do want to kind of have more ethical outcomes, we need to balance that, not by doing some bad things in order to kind of, you know, like do some good things, but we need to be delivering value in order to kind of be better equipped and listen to have that argument. And again, I think there's there's an interesting tension. You know, when I talk about moving quickly 
I'm talking about trying to get value into the hands of customers as quickly as possible. Like, that's not a bad thing. You know, that is about value generation. That is about kind of spreading as much value as possible as quickly as possible. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can't also think through the negative outcomes. I'm not saying be slapdash. I'm not saying, you know, just get it out and move on. Oh, you know, we'll, we'll deal with the spam issue. We we'll deal with the abuse issue later. That's a, that's a very different approach from saying, you know, this product, you know, I've spent, you know, I've spent five days perfecting it in, in Figma. I could spend another 20 and it would look perfect. But I'm going to be happy saying, actually, though, five days is enough. That's kind of the, the speed I'm talking about. Well, Andy, thank you for engaging <laughs> with my very intentional provocation there. I think that's been highly valuable and a very useful way of framing the challenge that lies ahead of designers. You've been talking about perfectionism and, and the whole balance of 80% of the result coming from 20% of the effort and our... I suppose, our disp predisposition to want to refine things to perfect. And I think everyone intellectually understands that that is not a wise way of spending our time and can lead to some pretty frustrating outcomes for the people around us. Now, you've touched on this as well, and you've taken this to another level where you've said, and I'll quote you again now, you've said, chasing perfection is a risk to our own mental health and our collective well-being. Now, I want to zero in on the mental health aspect there as I feel like we've covered the collective well-being uh, in the sense that it's not doing design a service if we, if we pursue perfection. So how can the design leaders that are listening to us today, how can they help themselves perhaps, uh, but definitely their teams to let go of this white-knuckle pursuit of perfection so they can build a, a healthier culture for design and help to increase design's influence i mean it, it's a difficult one because in a weird kind of way i don't think designers should let go of wanting something to be perfect because that's sort of you know that's a that's you know one of our key skills to some extent but we have to get more comfortable with the fact that it can't be in, and never will be and probably you know so so it, it's the balance you know you're always striving perfection but you need to be comfortable that you're never going to get there. And so th the way I kind of explain this is like, you know, I, you know, I see so many teams um, who have been slogging to produce, you know, like a new version of a product. And, you know, they've been doing it for maybe a week, a month, six months, whatever. And they finally get it out. And you look at it as a product manager, as the owner, as a customer. And this is so much better. It's so much easier to use. It's so much faster. It's so much more intuitive. And you look around the team and you'd expect the designers to be happy and high-fiving and like really chuffed that they've made this thing better. And it looks like a wake. It looks, everyone's really depressed. And you're like, what's going on? It's like, oh yeah, it was fine. But we could, you know, I, I wish they'd have listened to us. It's always a they. I wish they'd listened to us because we could have done X and we could have done Y and we could have done Z. And if we'd have just done these things, we know it would have been perfect. And, and what's happening there is while everybody else is looking at the 80% that the team did do the designers are looking at the 20 percent they couldn't get through and they have this vision of like well if only we'd have done all of this it would have been perfect and so actually the thing that we're left with is is significantly worse than what they had in their mind and if that happens you start initially you go oh this is really annoying and the next time you start blaming people and the third time you're like this company doesn't get it i'm going to go somewhere else and the cycle repeats and and so i see so many designers particularly they start to get in the middle of their career feel so crushed so fed up with it all because nowhere have they been they've been allowed to produce the perfect thing that they know is possible but a lot of that i think is because they're trying to get perfection in one go they're trying to play the perfect game of chess they're not playing multiple hands of of poker with a realization that you can never have the perfect hand through skill alone because the nature of poker is it so dependent on luck and chance and randomness? And I think the business world and the product world has a similar set of forces. And so we're always looking that I wish we played this perfect hand. If only 
we'd have been playing a different player. If only I'd have got two aces, if only that person hadn't, you know, put all of their money in, you know, I could have won. It would have been better. And Andy, so, are, you, are you suggesting that we're at, at risk of becoming, you know, those old people in the pub that complain <laughs> about what what life could have been and, and reflect on the glory days, ones that they could never quite capture? Possibly. I don't, I don't know quite about that, but I just, I just think that we are constantly setting ourselves up for a level of expectation that the reality of the situation that we find ourselves in just doesn't allow. And there's only so many times you can be disappointed before it starts to kind of really, really hit you in your core. So to answer your question, because you actually had a really good question, the question wasn't like, what's the problem? It's like, what you can do? So as a design leader, I think you need to constantly be reminding people how worse the product was before the designers got involved. You know, you did this great thing. You did that great thing. Like you've, you've massively improved the experience. Like our experience has gone from a three out of 10 to an eight out of 10. And it wasn't a 10, but it's an eight out of 10. This is what's going on with our net promoter score. This is what's going on with our conversions. Like all of these great things are the things that you and the team did. So constantly reminding people, bringing them out of the morning period of the things they didn't get done and focusing on the great things they did. I think as leaders, we need to be praising people more um, and not, you know, I think there's a tendency for leaders to assume that everyone accepts that they know they're doing really good work. And so we ignore the praise bit because we're like, oh, you know, we know Mary, we know Hakim, like they know that I really, really appreciate their work. And so all I'm going to do, the only feedback I give them is negative feedback. Why didn't you do that? That was wrong. This was wrong. But if we're not vocalizing the good stuff, Actually, the reality is all our team here is pick, pick, pick. That wasn't good enough. That wasn't good enough. That wasn't good enough. And if someone is constantly picking at you, then you're going to kind of be predisposed to be looking for all of the problems and all the errors. And so I kind of think that we need to praise people five times the amount that we we criticize them. And actually, the praise gives you the the power to Be critical because when you're critical, people listen to you. It's the same as I was saying about kind of like designers being able to kind of like have the moral input. It's like if you are delivering value, if people know that I feel safe, I feel looked after, that my boss really appreciates my input, then when they say, oh, actually, that hasn't worked and this is why and this is what I'd like you to do in, in the future, you're like, oh, well, this is great because I know all the other things are kind of reinforcing me. With all, if all they hear is negative stuff, then you're going to start to kind of behave the way that I've described. On the designer's point of view, again, this is a real common problem. Like you do all this stuff, you get to the end of the year and you're like, what have I done? What have I achieved? You know, what actually have I, I kind of contributed? And, you know, you did a bunch of workshops, you know, you put a bunch of screens, some of which have launched, some of which have haven't, but it's really easy to forget. And so, on the designer's point of view, I always recommend people create a brag document. And the brag document is every time you've done something good, note it down. Oh, yeah, like I did help that person prep for their workshop and that workshop really well. And they thanked me. OK, I'll note that down. Oh, yeah, actually, I did kind of talk the marketing you know, manager off the cliff from, you know, in, you know, including that, you know, three extra steps on the on the sign up form. And what we've seen is actually as a result, sign ups have gone way up because the, the 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 friction was down. Oh, you know, oh yes, like I cycled back on the project I launched and found that actually we hit all our KPIs and and and, and got better. You know, keeping a constant log of all of the successes brings your mind more into this expansive kind of like success kind of space rather than constantly picking out the 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 bugs and the problems but the picking out the bugs and the problems is what we do you know like i kind of think it's really frustrating being a designer because everyone else bimbles around the world being perfectly happy using broken experiences but you'll go and you'll buy a train ticket from a kiosk that no one else is moaning about and you'll be like why was that button put there and not over there because actually it's a, the hit area is much better if it's in the corner rather than like floating around in the middle of the screen. That's really, really bad design. And actually why they use that language, not this language. Like we are so predisposed to find broken things everywhere, but we also have the power to fix them. I think that's the brilliant thing around designers. Like a lot of the rest of our peers, they don't see the things that we see. And I think we have a duty to, to, to shine a light on this stuff. And if we can shine a light on these problems, a lot of the time it's not because our product managers or marketing managers are evil. 
or our engineers are evil. It's just because they don't see what we see. And when we go, oh, like, there's a problem here and we explain it in a way that isn't petulant and annoying, but it's like, actually, like, this is going to be, you know, this is a really important thing we need to focus on. They'll go, oh, yeah, I hadn't really thought of it like that. So it's a superpower. I don't want to give it away, but we need to balance it with feeling secure and safe and knowing that we're doing a good job. So speaking of seeing problems in the world and then wanting to fix them and also of criticism, in rather self-deprecating fashion, you once said that as a manager, you felt like the living embodiment of the Peter principle, which is the idea that people rise to the level of their incompetence, which I had a laugh and clearly you were joking here. But I suppose the key thing here is that you are self-aware enough to realize when you're running up against your own limits. And I wanted to know and understand from you, what was it or what has throughout the years made you from time to time realize that you needed to become a better leader? Oh, I mean, again, there's a bunch of different things in there. I don't think this is quite the answer to your question, but I think there are fundamentally two different ways that that people express their leadership. You have the typical kind of like black turtleneck design genius architect god who wants to surround themselves with kind of sycophantic juniors who look up to them. And that's incredibly ego driving. You know, it's great to be a creative director in an agency when everyone runs around and like your word is God. But it's this kind of weird, kind of slightly kind of problematic behavior where you've built an organization to kind of meet all of your needs. I don't kind of like that kind of top of the pyramid kind of approach. I much prefer uh, servant leadership which is basically having a really good understanding of what you're good at and what you're not good at. And the things you're not good at, in order for the company and for your team to grow, you need to get someone who's better than you. So, you know, I was, you know, I was, I was an okay programmer, but I wasn't a great programmer. So you, you get programmers in. I was okay at CSS, but there were much better people out there than me. So you hire better front-end developers and front end JavaScript people. I was okay at design, but there were much better designers out there. And so you slowly start, bringing better people in than you because that's the only way that you get good is surround yourself by amazing people but the reality and that's how that's how a manager sort of thrives i think there's this there's this old-fashioned notion like that comes from sort of like the 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 industrial shop floor that the foreman is the one that knows how to use all the machines and knows how to make all the parts and their job is to teach every single person how the machine work and how the, how the parts is is made that's not how knowledge work functions knowledge work is basically you hire all these people that are great crafts people that are that are experts in their field and if you hire all these people that are experts you can't hope to be as good at every single one of their jobs as as each individual so you have to be comfortable in knowing that you know a lot less than the collective knowledge of of the organization what you do is you become a talent scout. So you find these amazing people. You create the space in the environment where they can do their best work. You help coordinate. And when there are disagreements, you, you know, help decide which of the paths is the right path based on competing um, outcomes. And I think this is, this is the role of a good manager. And I think it's the role of a good product manager as well to not necessarily be dictating, but when you... When somebody has a domain expertise, you you appreciate the expertise and you don't think that your level of knowledge is the same as theirs. And so if someone says we absolutely have to do this, you kind of defer to it. But if there are trade offs or if people can't decide, you kind of, you know, you cast the sort of deciding vote and, and, and balance these things. And so I think that's the way in, in a modern knowledge working kind of fashion you have to present as a manager. Given all the design leaders that you coach and the designers that you know, the design leaders that you've met throughout the years, what would you say is the most obvious limiting belief that regularly occurs in those people or perhaps mental block that they have that is getting in the way of them being more effective leaders? There is a really clear pivot point I find in the, um, the life and progression of a design leader. That is most design a lot of it is about the journey they go on so a lot of designers become design leaders become managers because of the frustrations they've experienced as an ic as an individual contributor 
And they're like, hey, I will solve all these problems when I get a manager. Because when you become a manager, you have all the power in the world. You can change all the things and everything will be fine. And then you become a manager and you realize actually that's not the case at all. Actually, things are just really hard. I think it's kind of like, you know, you're a kid. It's unfair. Why can't I stay up late? Blah, blah, blah. And then you become a parent. And you're like, actually, you know, like this is messy and horrible and difficult. And, you know, I don't know what I'm doing any more than, than my parents did now. And you come to kind of realize the sort of the limitations. But what typically happens is you still view your job as a manager to gather up all the gripes of my team and take them to your boss and say, fix all of these things. And what happens then is you are seen as somebody that just comes with problems and makes it somebody else's job and somebody else's job to fix. And that isn't great because you're not hired necessarily just to come up with a whole bunch of problems and then give them to somebody else. And so it can be really difficult to move on and to reposition yourself out of that. And I think what typically happens, the switch is a realization that you've not actually been hired just to kind of take all the gripes of your design team and pass them on. You've been hired to deliver a set of business outcomes, a set of strategic initiatives that the organization has designed, and your job is to deliver them through the medium design. So your design team is no longer, like your design team is a conduit for the delivery of a set of missions, goals, strategies, outcomes. It's not a group of people that you're trying to be best friends with in order to solve all their needs in order to create this design nirvana. And what typically happens is you switch to what's known as having a first team mentality. You go from thinking the people I am serving are my designers to the people I'm serving are my peers in the organization. I'm actually serving my marketing colleague, my sales colleague, my business colleague. My job is to work with these people, my executive team, my first team, to understand how I can use design to advance the mission of the organization. And you want to do it in a way that you still you know, have a great design team and, and they're working efficiently and they're happy, but your job is no, no longer just to kind of solve all the gripes to kind of make this sort of perfect nirvana. So that might mean that sometimes you have to make decisions that your design team aren't going to like or appreciate. I'm sorry, we can't hire that extra design leader or, or salesperson or sorry, not salesperson, like content marketer or content designer, whatever this year, because we just don't have the budget because we need to deliver X, Y, Z. And you end up becoming the baddie. You end up becoming the parent that says, I'm sorry, it'd be lovely if you could stay up till midnight and eat sweets all the evening. But actually, you've got to go to bed because you've got to get to school tomorrow. And you know what it's like if you, you know, if, if you if you eat all the sweets, you'll probably vomit. And that's not good. So, you know, we need to start realizing that it's our, the other partners, the parents uh, uh, that we need to be supporting and the teachers rather, you know, it, rather than just trying to sort of pander to the whims of the design team. And that is a tough switch to, to make. And I think that's where most design leaders get kind of stuck in that kind of gap. I spoke with Peter Merholtz and separately Jesse James Garrett a little while back at the end of last year. And they also, like you, have a keen emphasis and coaching practice on helping design leaders to become more effective. And it seems to me at least they share a, a common thesis around one of the core problems here is that design leaders who are going from IC into their first design management role often are modelling their behaviour on the design managers or leaders that have come before them, but not having the full 360 perspective on what that design leader was contending with when they're dealing with their other parents, as you've, as you've suggested. First of all, I suppose, is that something that you've also observed to be true? And that there is a, a sort of a, a lack in tools and resources or coaching or whatever it may be to help designers see the role for what it needs to be. And if that if you do if you don't, then I'd be keen to hear your other your, your perspective on it. But if you do, aside from getting outside coaching, what is the thing that needs to happen here so that this isn't so much of a stumbling around in the dark exercise for design leaders as they progress through their careers? I think so. I mean, I, you know, I really like Jesse. I really like Peter. You know, I, I think I would probably agree with ninety five percent of what they say. So I haven't I haven't heard the conversation that you've had with them, but I suspect they're they're on the money there. I possibly because of my kind of geographic location, I think I'm at a slightly different place to than where a lot of the people that they coach are. A lot of the people that I coach, they are often the first design leader in their organization, or the first first design leader of their level in the organization. 
which means that they actually aren't moving into somebody else's shoes. They're, they don't have a model of good or bad behavior to follow. There's no model of behavior. They are, they've been given a sort of butterfly promotion and they're told to sort it out and figure this stuff out on their own. And that's really, really tough. You know, we've only really seen, I think, an explosion of design leadership in the last sort of six or seven or eight years. So I think a lot of people are first, second, third time design leaders and don't have that kind of history, which is different from engineering leadership because engineers tend to outpace designers five or 10 to one. These are all problems that our engineering partners have been having to deal with a lot longer. And actually, one of the pieces of advice I give a lot of, of, of my coaching clients is to go and befriend the design, go, go and befriend the engineering leaders, because the problems that you're facing now, they probably faced five years ago. And the things you're trying to solve now, they've already figured out ways. They already know how to scale a team from 10 to 50 to 100. They already understand how to do good performance reviews, or one would hope they would. They already have an understanding and are focusing on things like diversity. You know, all of the problems you're facing as a five-person team have already been solved somewhere in the organization. They might not have been solved in the way that you would like them to be solved, but at the very least, you know, there's a there's prior art. And so... I think that's the challenge that I see most of my people that I support, even if they're a VP of design or VP of product, they're the first VP of product that that person, that company's had. And so there's no clear path to follow from design. So they have to look elsewhere. I had a conversation a couple of years ago with Jane Austen. I don't know if you've come across Jane over there in the UK. I think she's most recently the chief experience officer at Digitas UK. Um, she came from, I think it was the Telegraph and then Babylon Health and a few others that she was at before in a design and product leadership role. And she found that when she first stepped into design management, that being promoted from an IC to a manager came with a whole bunch of baggage and feeling and consideration for the people that were previously peers and that now she was in charge of managing. And it was a really rocky thing for her to navigate early on until she figured out what the boundaries needed to be and how she could be effective in the management role. And you said something that, again, sort of intentionally, I'm going to put this to you um, as a provocation um, that I somewhat struggled with, but I suspect that there's some wisdom here that I didn't fully grasp. And that is, you, you've said that if you are a design leader, you need to look after your team like they are your own family. Now, this is a this the family metaphor is has been used before when it comes to leading people, and I've always struggled with it because as a metaphor, I feel that family is permanent, uh, teams are temporary, and the relationships that we have with family members are often not appropriate in the workplace. Some of the things that go on there. So, how do you treat people as a your team as a family while still challenging them and holding them accountable to the objectives that are important to that team and to the wider business without them, you know, without you not being effective in doing that. And I think you've described this as a descent into ruinous empathy if you don't quite get that balance right. Like how do you, how do, you do that? How do you position yourself? Well, I, I don't recognize the, the the quote but to be honest i say a lot of things on the internet and at, at conferences and I, I do think when when i started clear left i think we did run it i did run it as a family and there was a lovely period of time when um that worked and that clicked but i definitely feel in the last 10 years i have moved away from that as a particularly helpful um framing i actually think it's like you i think it's a problematic framing because you don't have to make your family redundant if you're if one of your family members is underperforming you don't necessarily have to have a kind of a difficult conversation with them i, I actually think a better metaphor is a sports team and it's a challenging metaphor because what happens if you have a sports team you have players who are performing on a on a game to game a season to season basis but there is a point at which they might stop performing. And if you can't raise their performance up, you might need to reposition them or you might need to, you know, eventually like let them go and bring somebody else in who's a who's a better performer. And that might seem harsh. You know, we're in a period where there are really challenging layoffs at the moment. A lot of people are having questions around why they've been let go and whether this is fair or not. And I think uh, there's a lot of 
emotion and 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 kind of debate going on at the moment. But I kind of think that if you take a sports team mentality, you can kind of understand. I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but you can understand um, why you might have to reshape teams when the mission changes, the 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 the, um, the strategy of the opposing team changes, the market changes. And I think a lot of the reason why a lot of people are feeling really stressed at the moment, apart from the fact that, frankly, losing your job is horrible, finding yourself, you know, you, a lot of these people that have been made redundant recently had plans and, and, and healthcare needs and visas that were reliant on these jobs. And to have that ripped away without any kind of, you know, notice is really challenging. And also, I think, a lot, you know, there are some companies that have done really well and have, have given people incredibly generous redundancy packages and have helped them land their new jobs. And, and there's some really good practices there. But there are also practices where people have gone into the office one day and just, uh, you know, they've found that they've been made redundant because their passes are no longer working, which is awful. And I think what happens there is a lot of people have been sold on this idea that we're part of a family and they buy into the idea they're part of a family. And in a family, you, your your family members go to bat and you don't get cut free. You don't get let go. And so a lot of this language has been used to kind of make people feel warm and welcome and homely. And when suddenly there's an international kind of like downturn and you know, companies start making people redundant, there's a real sense of betrayal. And that betrayal happens because they have been taught that they're part of one kind of organisation and suddenly they're waking up to realizing, well, actually, no, I'm not. I'm I'm, I'm a different kind of organization. So I think there's a there's a bit of a bait and switch going on. And so yeah, I I definitely I definitely don't use the family metaphor anymore because I think it's actually not only is it is it inappropriate, but I think it it can be emotionally manipulative. You know, it can be a great way of getting people to work really hard by going, oh, don't you care about our mission? And you kind of want people to care about the mission, but but at the same time organizations don't have any or large organizations anyway they're not in it to create long-term value for the team they're in it to create long-term value for their shareholders and we can debate the benefits of of capitalism but we need to be a little bit more realistic about what working for these kind of companies is like and again i think you know i think there's there's you know the reality is i think a lot of people you know a lot of smaller companies want to maintain really really you know they want to have a family kind of um like experience and so founders will drop in salary they'll do everything they can to kind of keep keep the team cohesive but in very very large organizations that's not their that's not their goal and so um it's problematic that kind of language i think mm. Andy, just mindful of time i've got one final question for you today you're clearly someone who's thought a lot about what it takes to be a great design leader. You've convened a massive community globally of design leaders to help try and figure this out. And you're personally mentoring and coaching design leaders. And you've touched on that we're entering, we're already in a very difficult economic time. And a lot of people are under stress if they haven't already lost their job, they're worried about whether they will. During such a time, what do you believe is important for designers to remember or perhaps do? Hmm. That's a very good question. I don't think I have a very good answer. I think, I think one of the challenges is that a lot of people in the workplace at the moment have never experienced anything other than a rising market. There are a lot of people that entered the workplace in 2009, 2010, and missed the last downturn. And actually, to be honest, the last downturn, at least in the UK, while a lot of other industries were sinking, the tech industry was still going up. So the previous downturn was kind of in, in the late 90s. And very, very few people in the current market were around in that, in that turn. So I think... There are a few old JD people like me that have seen two or three downturns and have realized that this is a cyclic thing that happens and are comfortable that this cycle will happen and will continue to happen. But if you've never experienced it, it can feel like the world is falling in your head. It can feel like, you know, I thought it was always going up and to the right. I were making plans based on, you know, the, the slow and steady increase of my salary, the slow and steady increase of my option package. And now the bottom's fallen out. The only thing I can say is like, you know, this is it's a really cra crappy experience. 
and it's going to be hard for people to bounce back. I think, you know, if everyone's tightening their belts, we're going to see a lot of people who are really, really talented who are going to struggle to find new places. And so I think people will be looking for longer. I think there'll be downward pressure on, on salaries as well. So I think it's going to be a tough time. But I also know that these cycles do repeat themselves. And I'm sure in a year or two's time, the economy will get better. Interest rates and inflation will be down. There'll be another boom. And in the meantime, there's, there is opportunity. You know, I think a lot, of, um, a lot of new products get started in downturns. A lot of people, if they are unfortunate enough to find themselves unemployed, might use that as an opportunity you know, while they're looking for work to start new initiatives, to start small agencies, to start new product companies, to start thinking about what, what they can do where they have a bit more control over their own future rather than be controlled by by other people. And so I really hope that the outcome of this, as is often the case in downturns, will be a, a blossoming of, of value. It's not quite the same, but you know, some of the the best times of culture if i think about kind of like the culture that came out of the 70s and the 80s you know the the music the the art the um the the movies a lot of that came out of a really really tough economic climate because it forced people to go to places that they wouldn't necessarily have risked otherwise but now there's nothing to lose and so they can start experimenting and so i do hope that culturally we will see a lot of positive out of this, but that doesn't change the the short term pain that a lot of people will be experiencing. So yeah, I don't know if I've got a good answer to that, but I all I can say is it's cyclic and this will pass. I think the internet uh, has shown, you know, and, and digital technology has shown an awful lot of resilience. Andy, this has been a hugely insightful conversation about design and design leadership today. Thank you for so generously sharing those insights with me and also everyone else. And thank you for your outstanding contribution to the field of design over the past 20 or so years. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, too kind. Mm, you're most welcome. Hey, Andy, if people want to keep in touch with you, follow along with what you're up to and all the wonderful writings and other things that you put out in the world, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, wow. I mean, the, rea the real answer is an answer I also almost feel a little bit kind of guilty about saying, which is Twitter. I've been a long term Twitter user and I, I've built up a community of followers and people and I feel like I'm kind of the, the last kind of holdout. I feel like I'm the grumpy old man in Up where everything else has been demolished around them and I'm still wanting to, to stay on Twitter. But it is a hell site. I do not support the things that, that Elon Musk is doing to that that site. I can totally understand why a lot of people are fleeing to other platforms, including Mastodon. I've tried playing around with Mastodon. I can't get my head around it. And so I'm kind of like sticking with Twitter in the hope. Yeah, I don't know what I'm hoping for. But, you know, to be honest, frankly, I feel the same with the UK. You know, like I, I'm British. You know, I've seen the UK completely decimated over the last kind of five or six years. But I, it's my home. And so it's one of those things where, like, I hate what the government's doing. I hate what, you know, the narrative that's happening in the UK at the moment. But I kind of like I, I don't know any other place to be. This is this is where I'm kind of brought up. And so I feel the same with Twitter. If you want to come and follow me, I'm Andy Bud on Twitter. But don't judge me. But also, you know, if you don't feel that you want to spend time on Twitter, I completely understand. I also, you know, andybud.com or... Andy Budd on Medium if you want to read some of my um, one of my ramblings. And I believe you can also find uh, your Andy at Andy Budd on LinkedIn as well. So if you want to follow along there, I'll make sure that we link to all of those locations. And Andy, if you change your mind about Twitter in the future, let me know and I'll change it to Macedon or whatever it is that you <laughs> decide to do there. Hey, thanks, Andy. And thanks to everyone that's tuned in. It's been great having you here as well. Everything we've covered will be in the show notes, including detailed chapters and where you can find Andy and all the things we've spoken about. If you enjoyed the show and you want to hear more conversations like this with World Class leaders in UX design and product management where we get to real depth on topics that matter to us then please leave a review on the podcast also pass it along just to one other person that you feel would get value from these conversations and subscribe so it turns up weekly if you want to find me you can find me on LinkedIn just under Brendan Jarvis or a link to my profile at the bottom of the show notes as well or just head on over to thespaceinbetween.co.nz that's thespaceinbetween.co.nz and until next time Keep being brave.